Um, I think we'll just go ahead and get started. People can join as they come. So let me start by thanking everybody who's here for attending this Miller Dwan Foundation mental health webinar. We're really glad you're here today. I think you're in for a treat. I'm Joan Oswald with the Miller Dwan Foundation. And the foundation, which is located in Duluth, Minnesota, is an independent healthcare foundation. We focus primarily on mental health and we do an awful lot with physical therapy as well. If you aren't familiar with us and want to know more, certainly go to our website at mdfoundation.org. Just a few little things to note before I introduce today's speaker. Um, please, if you haven't already, go ahead and mute yourself. If you want to see only our speaker on your screen, click on the speaker view up in the right hand corner of your screen, upper right hand corner. Um, anytime during the webinar, Dr. Evie has been gracious enough to give us a chance to ask questions. If you have questions, please post them in the chat. We'll monitor the chat, chat and we'll also have time for questions at the end. Any questions so far? All right. On to our speaker, then Dr. Georgia Eady is a Harvard trained psychiatrist. She specializes in nutritional and metabolic psychiatry. Her two decades of clinical experience include 12 years at Smith College and Harvard University Health Services. And that's where she was um, the first really to offer nutrition-based therapies as an adjunct or alternative to psychiatric medication. In, doc, in 2020, Dr. Edie developed the first CME accredited clinician training program in ketogenic diets for mental health. In 2022, she co-authored the first inpatient study of the ketogenic diet for serious mental illness and was named a recipient of the Bazunsky, Bazuski, I'm sorry, Dr. Edie. It's Bazuki. Bazooki, of course it is. Bazooki, <laughs> almost like the bubble gum. Bazooki Brain Research Fund's first annual Metabolic Mind Award. Dr. Edie speaks internationally about nutrition science, nutrition policy reform, and dietary approaches to psychiatric conditions. And she writes about food and the brain for psychology today and for her own website. Diagnosis Diet. We've had the chance to um, read some of those articles, and if you haven't yet, please do. Um, they're quite, uh, quite good, quite enlightening. Her forthcoming book, which we're all excited about, is called Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind, and that will be published in January 2024. So Dr. Edie, thank you so much for joining us. We're so glad you're here and take it away. Let us know what you might need. Thanks really so much, Joan, for that very nice introduction. And thanks uh, to all of you fellow clinicians who took time out of your busy schedules to, to be here today. Uh, the information that I put together for you is designed not only to bring you up to speed on, on the latest developments in this really exciting emerging field of nutritional and metabolic psychiatry, but it's also to give you some tools and resources that you can begin using right away in, in your clinical practice um, that you can use to help empower your patients, improve their overall brain health and improve mental health outcomes in a lot of cases, um, uh, even without having to take any special training. So uh, that, that's, an, that's an extra that you can do if you like, but, but hopefully you'll, you'll get some tools out of today that will be, that will be worth your time. So there are only three main questions that we're going to address today. Uh, one is what foods belong in and don't belong in a brain healthy diet. Uh, the next is how are poor metabolic health and poor mental health connected? And the third is what is the role of ketogenic diets in the treatment of psychiatric conditions? A, a lot of people think of ketogenic diets as a weight loss diet primarily, but it was originally designed as a brain health diet uh, over a hundred years ago now. 
So I've got about an hour's worth of material with the slides uh, for, for this 90 minutes. So, um, and Kathy's graciously offered to, to offer to field questions. So please feel free to ask questions during, it'll make the time together feel more engaging and interactive and less like a lecture, which would be great. So um, let me just uh, begin sharing my screen. So you can see the slides. All right, here we go, good. So um, I've been using low carbohydrate and ketogenic diets as well as other types of dietary interventions in a variety of clinical settings for more than 10 years now, but I wasn't always a nutrition oriented clinician. For the first 10 years of my career, my, my practice centered entirely around medications and psychotherapy. Um, I loved psychiatry even back then, but it was frustrating and sometimes you know, kind of heartbreaking to pour so much time and energy, heart and soul and years of specialized training into, into my work and only to realize that a lot of my patients weren't improving very much, not as much as I had hoped that they would. Uh, and, and when the medicines did make a difference, which sometimes they certainly do, it was often at the cost of burdensome side effects that are compromising physical health, metabolic health, financial health, <laughs> uh, quality of life, uh, lots, a lot of times weight gain, high blood sugars, even type two diabetes, or, um, or just feeling groggy and, and foggy all the time. So incorporating these nutritional and metabolic strategies into my work really completely changed the way I feel about practicing psychiatry and changed the way that my patients feel about their own mental health. And that's, that's, you know, the, kind of the power of these interventions. And you can use these interventions in conjunction with the, the uh, treatments that you're already using now. So you don't have to replace what you're doing. You can augment, you know, using nutritional and metabolic principles. So, um, so just a quick, how did we get here? So for decades, you know, we've thought of the biological underpinnings of mental health disorders as largely, largely as chemical imbalances imbalances in neurotransmitters like serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, uh, glutamate, GABA, these are most, most, the most familiar um, neurotransmitters. Um, and the neurotransmitter theory of, of depression, that was born in the 1950s, so about 75 years ago now, and completely accidentally, like many treatments are discovered accidentally, uh, it was actually discovered that a, a drug that was used to, to treat tuberculosis called ipronizid uh, it also happened to improve mood in some tuberculosis patients. And that drug worked by increasing levels of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine in the synapses between brain cells. And that was, the, that was when the neurotransmitter theory of depression was born. And so then targeting these neurotransmitters led to the development of antidepressants like serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, uh, Prozac, Effexor, et cetera. And then you know, over the decades, Psychiatric medication use, usage has risen steadily. And now one in six Americans takes at least one psychiatric medication. Uh, but how, how well do they work? Um, I mean, they definitely pulled psychiatry out of the dark ages and they revolutionized psychiatric care, care you know, compared to how we were providing care for people before then, but they don't work very well. So you know, the best studies available find that about 50% of people improve on an antidepressant, but, uh, but that's only 10% better than placebo. Uh, and antipsychotics do fare somewhat better. Uh, about 23% of patients respond, and that's about almost twice as good as placebo. So they do make a difference for some people, particularly antipsychotics, really, as all of you know, who work with patients all day long, they can be really important tools uh, to help people feel better. So some people do respond. And so there's definitely some truth to the neurotransmitter theory and, and medications can be helpful. And I believe they still belong in the toolkit, but all of my years of medical and residency training, we, we never stopped to ask that I can recall. We never stopped to ask what might be causing those neurotransmitter imbalances in the first place. And what I've come to believe through years of studying and reading and writing about these things and practicing in a new way is that I've come to believe that the most powerful way to change brain chemistry, although you can do it with medications, is through food because that's where brain chemicals come from in the first place. And not just the chemicals, but the structure, every cell, um, every salt molecule, every piece of the brain comes from food. 
And and the the fact of the matter is, and this is the the tough thing that I think has gotten us into into a lot of trouble, is that most of us have been feeding our brains incorrectly for our entire lives. So we have no idea how much better we would feel if we fed our brains correctly. And and that's because uh, we're given the wrong information about what we are supposed to eat. Um, So this, you know, the combination of the industrialization of the human diet that's created factory food products that are really toxic to the brain. And that in combination with our official nutrition guidelines and most media headlines about food and human health that we read, they're wrong. And they're wrong because they're grounded in unscientific questionnaire-based guesswork, uh, something called a nutritional epidemiological study, which we do not need to get into today but it's not a scientific method. It is a guesswork, it's guesswork that creates theories, ideas, hypotheses about how foods and diets, food and diseases might be related, but it is not a scientific, it, there are no scientific experiments conducted and there is no data generated and there's no real, uh, there are no real conclusions that you can draw from these studies. Uh, so this is why we're in the, the pickle that we're in now from a nutritional perspective. And so, Now, poor nutrition isn't the only cause of our global mental health crisis, but it stands to reason that the brain will develop best and function best and be most resilient in the face of adversity if we feed it a brain healthy diet. And we're we're accustomed to thinking about diets for weight loss. We're accustomed to thinking about heart healthy diets, but what is a brain healthy diet? I mean, I've spent the past 15 years thinking about this question. Um, And so I'll just summarize some of the main ideas here. Um, And fortunately, all the principles that we'll talk about today about food and the brain, they apply not only to the brain, but to the rest of the body as well. And after all, it wouldn't make sense for us to need a different diet for each organ that we possess. So all of our cells require the same nutritional care. So if it's good for the brain, it's good for the heart, it's good for the liver, it's good for the kidney, it's good for your entire body. So what is a brain healthy diet? So quite logically, a brain healthy diet needs to do three things. It must nourish the brain. It must nourish the brain, which means it must provide adequate amounts of all essential nutrients. Very simple. It must protect the brain from damage, and uh, it must provide energy uh, for the brain in ways that support healthy brain metabolism over the lifespan. Energy is everything to the brain. It's a very energy hungry organ. It uh, requires, it demands 10 times more energy than you would expect for an organ of its size. Um, So The two most important ways to achieve the goal of nourishing the brain, goal number one, nourish, uh, is to include animal foods in the diet and to avoid grains and legumes. And these these two principles are the opposite of what we are told we should do to be healthy. So why why does it make sense to include meat and other animal foods and to exclude grains and legumes, which we're told should be the foundation of our diet? From a nourishment standpoint, Uh, We think of plants as the best sources of vitamins and minerals, but the truth is that we can't meet our brain's nutrient requirements unless we include some meat, seafood, poultry, and or eggs in the diet. And that's because there are certain essential nutrients that don't exist in plant foods at all, such as vitamin B12, vitamin K2, and the omega-3 fatty acids EPA and DHA. And some of the nutrients that plants do contain come in the wrong form. So they're harder for us to absorb or utilize. So for example, this includes iron, vitamin A, and vitamin D. And so this is why I recommend that all of my patients include some animal protein and fat in their diets. And if they if they don't want to do that, they need to supplement very carefully. And after you know 13 years of working in college mental health with students who are very interested in plant-based diets, I met many, many hundreds of vegan and vegetarian students um, and ve- vegan diets in particular are quite quite challenging in terms of meeting nutrient requirements. I, I did not meet a single person following a vegan diet who was supplementing properly. Most would supplement, or many anyway, would supplement B12. But beyond that, there was very there's a lot of confusion about what else needed to happen. So, uh, but even if you include some animal foods in the diet, that doesn't necessarily guarantee adequate brain nutrition because we also need to avoid foods 
that interfere with the absorption and utilization of essential nutrients. And there are many naturally occurring compounds within grains and beans, grains and legumes, that interfere with nutrient availability. And these are called anti-nutrients, or I call them planty nutrients because they come from plants. You don't find these compounds in animal foods. So these include some really interesting uh, molecules like protease inhibitors that interfere with our ability to absorb protein, uh, oxalates and tannins that interfere with iron absorption, goitrogens, uh, these so-called goitrogens that can cause goiter, um, they interfere with iodine utilization and can lead to hypothyroidism or low thyroid activity, and phytic acid. Phytic acid is a mineral magnet that strongly interferes with the absorption of calcium, magnesium, iron, and zinc. And just to give you an example of the extent of, of you know, the, these aren't minor effects, uh, this is a, an experiment from 1979, really interesting, um, uh, that shows you how much zinc is absorbed into the bloodstream after consuming uh, zinc-rich oysters. Oysters are quite high in zinc. So if you eat oysters, you'll see the blood level rise very nicely as you do on this graph, showing that you've absorbed that zinc into your bloodstream. If you consume that same amount of oysters with black beans, you only absorb about half of the zinc in the oysters. And if you eat that same amount of, of oysters with corn tortillas, you absorb virtually none of the zinc from those oysters. So it's not a subtle effect. These are very strong effects. And the power of phytic acid uh, to block mineral absorption, that might help to explain why uh, zinc deficiency is more common in vegans than omnivores, may help to explain why iron deficiency is so common among women in general. Um, and and uh, because grains and legumes form the foundation of most diets around the world, uh, whether they include animal foods or not. We are, we, we are not only we, we are told to, to base our diets on these, they're also very inexpensive. And for some people, many parts of the world, um, the most nutritious foods available. So here in the United States, zinc deficiency affects at least 10% of the population, iron deficiency up to 20% of women, and according to some estimates, as many as 80% of Americans may be deficient in magnesium. And those statistics are really problematic because essential minerals serve really important roles in the brain, only some of which are, are listed here. And so this is why I recommend uh, uh, what I guess I would call a pre-agricultural whole foods dietary pattern, a sort of a so-called paleo diet of whole plant and animal foods. It's a whole foods diet, but it includes animal foods as well as uh, the post-agricultural plant foods, plant, uh, the uh, pre sorry, pre-agricultural plant foods, the plant foods we were eating before uh, the advent of agriculture when um, we started growing lots of grains and legumes uh, uh, for, for sustenance. So I recommend that as the most logical starting place for everyone who are who's concerned about uh, nourishing and protecting the brain uh, better. Unlike vegan diets, the paleo diet requires animal foods. Um, a vegetarian diet is perfectly fine because that can be based on eggs and that, that certainly counts. Those are very nutritious. Unlike the Mediterranean diet, which is often recommended as the brain healthiest diet, the paleo diet eliminates grains and legumes, as well as all modern processed foods, which the Mediterranean diet does not. So as we'll see later, because a paleo diet allows for fruits and starchy vegetables, unlimited amounts of fruits and starchy vegetables, not a low carbohydrate diet, for some people with compromised uh, metabolic health, which is now the majority of us, unfortunately, it, can, it may contain too much carbohydrate um, uh, to be healthy uh, or safe for some people. But it's a great starting place for everybody with healthy carbohydrate metabolism. Um, this includes a lot of children and teens who still have good metabolic health. It's perfectly safe for children, for pregnant women, and for people taking medications or, or who have uh, uh, pre-existing health conditions. There's no special training that you need to do to recommend these diets. Um, and so they're, they're safe for everyone. So, but, but even, you know, eating, eating the right foods, if you're including the right foods in your diet, that's a great step in the right direction. But let's say that you've, you know, built your brain of nutritious whole plant and animal foods, but then you reward yourself at the end of the day with 
a, a pro processed something sweet or a savory treat that's full of sugar and vegetable oil, some modern processed food. And what you've done is you've taken the, the nice healthy brain that you've built and you've dropped it into a very uh, unhealthy environment of inflammation, oxidative stress, and insulin resistance. Uh, and that's why following the paleo diet all the time, or as often as you possibly can, is what you need to protect the brain from damage because the paleo diet explicitly excludes the two signature ingredients of unhealthy modern diets, refined carbohydrates such as sugar, flour, fruit juice, processed cereals, and refined seed oils, so-called vegetable oils, like soybean, sunflower, and canola oil. Um, so we now understand even more than we did 10 years ago about the underlying features that are common to most psychiatric disorders. Um, in addition to the nutrient deficiencies we just talked about and the, and the neurotransmitter imbalances, which we talked about, um, their inflammation, oxidative stress, and insulin resistance. And we're going to talk more about each one of these separately, but I've put them together here on one slide because it just so happens that high blood sugar and high insulin levels all by themselves can lead to every single one of these underlying biochemical derangements that are on the slide. And while there are certainly other culprits out there, so for example, the vegetable oils, which we won't really have time to talk about today, the vegetable oils contribute substantially to inflammation and oxidative stress. Um, uh, but that's you know an, a, another topic entirely, but we're gonna focus on carbohydrate quality and quantity uh, for the rest of this presentation, which will lead us into ketogenic diets because uh, high glucose and insulin levels are by far not only the most common drivers of these brain damaging forces, but they're also the easiest to target and reverse with lifestyle changes. So, and, and it's not just about glucose, but also about insulin. And I'll show you how, how that connects. So whenever you have a glucose spike in the bloodstream, if you eat something that's sweet or starchy, your glucose level will rise and your insulin level will rise right on its heels uh, to, to squirrel away that glucose into your cells. And, and you might think, well, okay, that's fine. As long as insulin comes along and reduces the glucose back to normal, what should be the issue from a mental health standpoint? The issue is that insulin is so much more than just a simple glucose regulator. Even though that's what that's what I was taught in medical school, uh, I was taught to think of as insulin as a blood sugar regulator. It's actually a master growth hormone. And so as a master growth hormone, it orchestrates the levels and activity of numerous other hormones in the body. So for example, after eating a typical breakfast food, uh, maybe breakfast, you know, like cereal, bagels, fruit juice, sweetened yogurts, things that a lot of people eat for breakfast, you'll see a sharp glucose spike, and that will be followed by an equally uh, sharp spike of insulin to pull the glucose levels back down to normal. The problem is that if that glucose spike is too sharp because it's come from refined carbohydrates rather than a whole food, if it's come from sugar or juice or flour, the glucose spike will be exaggerated and then the insulin spike will be exaggerated. And then you'll see, what you'll see is the glucose coming down quite sharply. It, and, and as the body sees that glucose plummeting, it will perceive it as an emergency. And so the adrenal glands, which sit on top of the kidneys, respond by releasing stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, for example. And these are released to prevent glucose from falling too low, to, to prevent glucose from going down to dangerously low levels or hypoglycemia. So those same hormones that get released into the bloodstream, they can trigger a lot of symptoms that look and feel like anxiety, uh, palpitations, weakness, sugar cravings, anxiety, irritability. And it's not even in most cases the, that the glucose has dropped too low. A lot of people think, oh, well, I've got hypoglycemia because I have to eat uh, you know, frequently between meals or I don't feel well. In most cases, the glucose isn't coming down too low. It's that it's dropped so quickly that uh, the stress hormones have been released into the bloodstream. And what you're feeling or what your patient is feeling is the release of those stress hormones triggering those, those physiological reactions. It's actually the hormones are preventing hypoglycemia and that's what's causing those symptoms. So um, you can see a really good example of this in this study. Uh, 
perfectly healthy teenage boys uh, when they were given either a glucose sweetened cola or a sugar-free cola, their adrenaline levels spiked to more than four times their baseline, four to five hours later. So again, not a subtle effect. And the, the average person is consuming refined carbohydrates three, four, five, six times a day. And so uh, putting people on this invisible internal roller coaster all day long and, and even well into the night. And, and these dramatic peaks and valleys in glucose and insulin and stress hormones, uh, they affect the brain as well. So you're not just getting um, you're not just getting stress hormones. You're getting you're getting fluctuations in reproductive hormones uh, like like estrogen. You're getting uh, fluctuations in blood pressure regulating hormones like aldosterone. Many other hormones are tied into this uh, glucose and insulin roller coaster. So now the now what's happening in the brain uh, when you're getting a blood sugar spike and an insulin spike every time. Every time blood sugar spikes in the body, it spikes in the brain as well. So the higher the blood sugar, the higher the brain sugar. So um, there's no there's no barrier put. Uh, this, this, if you're looking at this slide in front of you, what you see on the left is a blood vessel kind of coming towards you, piercing the brain and coming towards you through the screen. And then the blood brain barrier is what separates uh, the your circulation, your your body circulation from the interior of your brain. And your brain tissue is there on the, on the right-hand side. Those are brain cells. And so glucose is filtered through the blood-brain barrier. Um, uh, and it's always about uh, uh, your, your, your brain glucose level is about 40% lower than your blood glucose level at all times. So if your blood sugar is high, your brain sugar will also be too high. And this is a problem because the brain is very sensitive to high glucose. High glucose levels can be damaging to the brain. So if you've got too much glucose uh, inside the brain, all of that extra glucose tends to stick. Uh, it sticks to proteins, to DNA, to other important components of cells. And, and what it does is it cripples those molecules and turns them into these things called advanced glycation end products. Those are abbreviated as AGEs. Um, so AGEs, um, they, they, they're kind of like these caramelized molecules that no longer function properly. And they can build up in between uh, brain cells and interfere with this, uh, brain cells' ability to send messages to each other. So to cope with that problem, uh, when, when the brain detects these crippled molecules, it responds by uh, releasing signaling molecules uh, like cytokines called inflammatory cytokines and oxygen free radicals to deliberately create inflammation. So it responds to these crippled molecules by deliberately creating inflammation. And that's important because that's the first step in uh, uh, responding to any kind of threat. Inflammation and oxidative stress are good and healthy and important parts of the immune system. You need this response to protect yourself. And so temporary controlled inflammation. It's a necessary first step. It's, you can think of them as you know ambulances that are rushing to the scene of an emergency. Then after the inflammation has done its job and dealt with the threat, the next step is supposed to be healing that damage, you know, clearing away those molecules, healing that damage, and returning the local neighborhood, uh, restoring peace to the neighborhood and bringing things back to the before. But for people who are eating high sugar foods three, four, five, six times a day, which is most of your patients, um, this process never gets a chance to quiet down. So instead of temporary controlled, healthy inflammation and oxidative stress, you get uncontrolled chronic inflammation and oxidative stress. So how could that, that contribute to psychiatric problems? Because we now know that inflammation and oxidative stress can, are, are, are common contributors. You see them in almost every psychiatric illness um, as major players. So how, how are they connected? What exactly is going on there? So one way that inflammation and oxidative stress can contribute to mental health problems is by throwing neurotransmitter systems out of balance. The very same neurotransmitter systems that we target with medications. And so um, the, the most commonly uh, cited example for how this works 
um, is, is uh, affects a variety of different neurotransmitters. So under normal circumstances, if you're looking at this pathway, you see on the left, we see tryptophan. So tryptophan is an essential amino acid that comes from dietary protein. So we have to eat it. It's, you know, in all kinds of foods. Um, it's used partly to, um, to make serotonin and melatonin. So you can see the arrow going down there on the bottom left. We use some tr tryptophan to make those neurotransmitters. But most of the tryptophan, even under normal circumstances, travels to the right down this pathway called the kynurenine pathway. And that pathway is used to help regulate the production of other neurotransmitters. It's helped to regulate the balance between inflammation and healing. So the two neurotransmitters that are the, the, the key players in this on this slide are glutamate and GABA. So glutamate is the brain's primary excitatory neurotransmitter. You can kind of think of that as the brain's gas pedal. And, uh, and GABA is the brain's primary inhibitory neurotransmitter or the brain's brake pedal. And these, these two neurotransmitters are widespread throughout the entire brain. And the balance between the two of them uh, essentially determines the brain's overall activity level at any given point in time. So when the system is in a healthy balance, as you see it here, where you've got roughly you know, the same amount of GABA as glutamate, um, you can think of this as kind of the Zen state. Everything's in healthy balance. However, under the influence of stress or excessive inflammation or excessive oxidative stress that we just talked about, what you get instead of that Zen state is you get something called the tryptophan steel. So less tryptophan travels down the serotonin melatonin pathway and, um, and uh, most of it travels down the lower branch of the kynurenine pathway. And the result of that shift is less serotonin, less melatonin, more dopamine, less GABA, and significantly more glutamate, up to a hundred times more glutamate than you would normally have under calm and peaceful conditions. So since glutamate is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter, instead of that Zen state, uh, what we now have on our hands is a state that the, the college students that I worked with for so many years would call freaking out. So this is not a state you want to be in all the time. So if this state persists or occurs too often, you know, for people who are eating uh, in an unhealthy way multiple times per day, it can lead to something called glutamate excitotoxicity, very dangerous for the brain. Um, and this is, this, is a, this is one of the conditions that you can see underlying some psychiatric illnesses such as bipolar disorder. So high uh, excess glutamate directly damages proteins, fats, nucleic acids like DNA, and mitochondria, the uh, energy generators inside of our cells. Remember, the brain is very, very dependent on a steady supply of high, uh, high amount of high quality energy. So damaging the mitochondria is not something you want to be happening. So the blood brain barrier that protects the brain from risky substances can, can be damaged in this process as well by too much glutamate. Um, and the cells of the hippocampus, the brain's learning and memory center can begin to die off. So high glucose levels can create high glutamate levels, which can be very toxic to the brain. Um, but high insulin levels can also be toxic to the brain for a completely different reason. Uh, so high insulin levels are far more common than high glucose levels, and they're far less likely to be detected at a routine medical visit. So when your patients get their blood glucose tested, uh, they're being they're, they're, they say they go for the annual physical. Um, their clinician is looking for diabetes. They're looking for type two diabetes. They test the blood sugar, the fasting blood sugar, and they say, "Oh, your fasting blood sugar is normal. Everything looks good. You don't have type two diabetes. Come back next year." What they're not testing is insulin levels, and insulin levels are rising slowly in the background for many many years on a high sugar diet because you need a lot more insulin to keep your glucose levels at a normal, in a normal range. Um, if you're eating the wrong way, you'll need a lot more insulin to keep that glucose normal. The glucose will stay looking normal for many, many years, but your insulin levels will be climbing higher and higher. That's what you want to be testing for is not fasting glucose levels, but fasting insulin levels. So your glucose might be under good control, but at what cost? 
So what's happening is that when insulin levels are running too high too often, the insulin receptors on the surface of the blood brain barrier, um, which you need to escort the insulin into the brain, um, the insulin receptors can gradually become resistant to insulin. They've just been bombarded um, with insulin uh, you know, for, too, for uh, too many times uh, too often. So the insulin receptors can become resistant to insulin and that can make it increasingly difficult for insulin to cross into the brain. Glucose still waltzes in, no questions asked, even if your blood sugar is very high, um, even if you have type two diabetes, you won't have any problem getting glucose into your brain what you'll have increasing difficulty with is getting insulin into the brain. And that's a problem. Um, so paradoxically over time, the higher the blood insulin, the lower the brain insulin. It's a huge problem because brain cells can't process glucose and turn it into energy or use it to do anything else without adequate insulin. Um, so as a result, if you have an insulin resistant brain, then your, your brain can be swimming in a sea of glucose, plenty of glucose, and still be starving to death because there isn't enough insulin. And that dire predicament is called cerebral glucose hypometabolism, just means sluggish brain glucose processing. Plenty of glucose, not enough insulin to use it. And that's a brain energy crisis. And that brain energy crisis caused by insulin resistance that's been shown to be a key driving force behind most cases of Alzheimer's disease. And that's led scientists even as long ago as 15 years ago to start calling Alzheimer's disease type three diabetes, meaning there's a problem with glucose processing in the brain that's leading to memory problems and destruction of brain tissue. Um, and what's happening is that, uh, and the research is very clear on this, is that Alzheimer's disease is preceded by decades of gradually slowing brain glucose processing. This is happening silently in the background without um, anybody detecting it unless they look for it. Alzheimer's disease does not happen overnight. Type two diabetes also does not happen overnight. The insulin levels are rising uh, quietly in the background for many, many years before you see the glucose rise and before you even see any memory problems. So. Um, and insulin resistance uh, now affects more than 50% of Americans. Um, only 12% of us have completely normal, healthy glucose metabolism. And about 53% of us have uh, a significant insulin resistance, which means that we have some insulin resistance at the blood brain barrier as well, most of us. And insulin resistance is also associated with, to varying degrees, with all of the psychiatric conditions you see listed on the slide. So it stands to reason that for a diet to be brain healthy, it needs to be designed in a way that keeps blood glucose and blood insulin levels in a healthy range. So that's the, that's the third goal. So nourishing by including uh, the correct foods uh, and excluding the foods that have anti-nutrients, protecting by excluding refined carbohydrates and seed oils primarily, and energizing properly. In order to energize your brain properly, it needs to have good access not only to glucose and not too much glucose, but also to insulin. And so in order to, in order to energize the brain properly, you need to have healthy blood glucose and insulin levels, keeping them in a healthy range. So that means avoiding refined carbohydrates like sugar, flour, fruit juice, processed cereals as much as possible, regardless of whether the diet is plant or animal-based. Um, even a vegan diet can be metabolically healthy. It may, may, you may have trouble meeting your nutrient goals, but at least you'll keep your blood sugar and insulin levels in a healthy range. It has nothing to do with how many plants or animals you eat. It has everything to do with the quality and quantity of carbohydrate in the diet. So, but once insulin resistance has developed, which is now the case for the growing majority of adults and even sadly a growing number of children who are eating industrialized diets, high sugar diets, Simply avoiding refined carbohydrates might not be good enough because the brain's ability to use glucose for energy, even from whole foods, healthy whole foods like fruits and vegetables, can become damaged. That's where a ketogenic diet can be uniquely therapeutic. So if switching somebody from 
kind of a standard modern industrialized diet that has lots of, you know, sugar and flour and vegetable oils in it. If you switch them to a whole foods diet that's, uh, um, and, and you know, remove the sugar and all the refined carbohydrates, that may be enough for some people to quiet down their glucose and insulin levels. But for some of us, it's no longer enough to do that. Unfortunately, even just eating a healthy whole foods diet won't uh, be uh, safe for, for, for all of us anymore because we've done so much damage to our insulin signaling system over time. So once insulin resistance has developed, um, you might need to move to a ketogenic diet. Um, so a ketogenic can be uniquely therapeutic in, in these cases. So the, the bad news is that the combination of a high brain glucose and low brain insulin, that's kind of your deadly one-two punch for brain health. Together, those can result in all of the root cause mechanisms of psychiatric disorders you see listed on the slide. But the good news is that the ketogenic diet has been scientifically shown for now over 100 years to help with all of these root cause mechanisms on this slide and more that are not even listed on the slide. It's, uh, it's a really powerful um, uh, intervention that helps on a number of different levels, a single intervention. So, what is a ketogenic diet, because even in circles where we talk about ketogenic diets all the time, there's still a lot of confusion around this term. Um, so we're going to go through uh, now a little bit about what a ketogenic diet is and, and what the science tells us about how it can be helpful with, with uh, psychiatric conditions. Um, any questions so far before we shift gears to ketogenic diets, Kathy? Hi, Dr. Edie. So far, there are no questions, but if oh. anyone does have some, please put them in the chat. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank um, you. All right. So, uh, and by the way, you can, you can call me Georgia. <laughs> and, okay, uh, will do. <laughs> and and my, my last name is pronounced Ede, by the way, which is a very unusual last name, but. Uh, okay, yeah. got it. <laughs> Thanks, Georgia. Sure. Okay, good. So, um, all right. So a ketogenic diet. So a ketogenic diet, there isn't just one ketogenic diet. It's like most diets. There's lots of different ways you can, you can create it. Lots of different ways you can construct it in lots of different types of food choices. Um, so, but what is it? A ketogenic diet, um, it, uh, what it does is it lowers insulin levels enough. It's any way of eating that lowers insulin levels enough to turn on fat burning and generate physiologically meaningful levels of ketones in the blood. And, and most experts would define a, a blood ketone level of between 0.5 millimole and three millimole to be clinically meaningful. So there are ketone meters you can buy, and you can ask me all these questions later um, at the end. Uh, ketone meters you can buy, which measure with a finger stick um, what, your, what your ketone levels are in the blood. Between 0.5 and three is considered clinically meaningful. If it's lower than that, it's not high enough. If it's higher than that, it tends to edge into the starvation range. So you're looking for kind of these moderate levels. So lots of different ways you can do this. Um, but, but in any case, um, uh, we were talking about how glucose goes into the brain, how it goes in easily, and how insulin can have a harder and harder time depending on how you're eating. But just like glucose ketones, which are um, when you burn fat, you make ketones, your ketones rise in your blood and they can, they can help feed the brain. So just like glucose, ketones cross easily into the brain, even in people with severe insulin resistance and severe metabolic damage, even in people with type 2 diabetes. So ketones are, enter easily. Uh, therefore, just like glucose, the higher your blood ketones, the higher your brain ketones. So the more ketones you have in your blood, the more ketones will be able to cross into your brain and feed hungry brain cells. Um, however, the big difference there are many, but the biggest difference between glucose and ketones is that glucose requires a fair amount of insulin to be processed, whereas ketones burn beautifully in a low insulin environment. You don't need a lot of insulin to process ketones and turn them into energy. That makes ketones an ideal fuel source for the insulin resistant, low insulin brain. Uh, and again, most of us now, more than 50% of us have this situation to some extent or another. So there are many different variations of the ketogenic diet, um, more than we have time to go into today, but just to give you a feel for this, because there are very strict ketogenic diets that drive ketone levels up pretty high. 
Those are the ones that were originally used called the classic ketogenic diet on the left. Those were originally used to treat uh, children with uh, treatment resistant epilepsy. Um, and then you've got uh, more moderate diets in the middle, modified ketogenic diets in the middle, which have more protein. And then you've got these modified Atkins diet, which are much, um, which are much more relaxed diets um, uh, that, that don't essentially put almost no cap on protein in most cases. So they go from strict to moderate to, to relaxed. And as you go from left to right, you're, you're becoming less and less ketogenic. So the modified Atkins diet, you may not even be in ketosis on that diet. Um, it depends on, on, on the person. So a wide variety. So when people are asking you or talking to you about ketogenic diets, um, it's important to, if they're asking you, well, isn't that, isn't that diet dangerous or, or isn't that, uh, isn't that the diet that, you know, that, that, um, uh, you know, I read somewhere that a ketogenic diet has a lot of side effects. They're usually talking about these very strict ketogenic diets that were used in children for so many years that were designed to stabilize, um, brain chemistry and mimic fasting. So they're really, really strict and they didn't contain very much protein, not enough protein. Um, and the other problems with them as well, but we can, we can talk more about that later if you like, in any case. Um, so like, sometimes you'll hear people say, I mean, there are many different variations of the diet, but, um, what they all have in common. So you notice when you go from left to right, what they all have in common is that the carbohydrate is kept extremely low, usually below 20 grams per day. Um, no more than 10% of calories from carbohydrates and usually closer to 5% of calories from carbohydrate. And that's in comparison to what the USDA recommends, which is a diet that contains between 45 and 65% carbohydrate. So critics warn that low carbohydrates diets are dangerous. They argue that they're dangerously unbalanced because they exclude or almost completely exclude an entire macronutrient, carbohydrates. Uh, you know, for years, my college students would would protest, oh, but Dr. E, my brain needs sugar. Um, it does. I mean, the brain does need glucose. The brain needs some glucose at all times. But that glucose does not have to come from the diet because the body can make its own glucose uh, very smoothly and reliably 24-7 from fat and protein. So as long as you've got enough fat and protein in the diet, you can make glucose easily. You don't need to consume any carbohydrate to feed your brain the glucose that it needs. Um, in fact, carbohydrates, the only macronutrient, the macronutrients are protein, fat, and carbohydrate. Carbohydrate is the only one that is entirely optional. We must eat protein. Uh, we must even eat some fat, but we can do completely without carbohydrate if we wish to. doesn't mean you have to, but it's, it's safe to do so. So, um, <clears throat> It, but if your patient chooses to include a, a decent amount of carbohydrate in their diet, it's really important to make sure that the types of carbohydrate that they're eating and the amount is safe for their personal metabolism. And this is where the personalized piece of, 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 of these interventions comes into play. Because some people have a high carbohydrate tolerance and do very well on diets that contain 100 grams or more per day of carbohydrate, whereas others of us can no longer tolerate that much. So it really depends on the person. So even, you know, even the Institute of Medicine back in 2005, as the slide shows, acknowledged that the amount of carbohydrate we need is zero grams per day. But uh, it, again, it depends on the person, how much you can get away with. Excuse me. So this is a screenshot of an actual continuous glucose monitor reading uh, from a patient of mine with bipolar disorder. Um, and he did not think he needed to eat a low carbohydrate diet because he, he wasn't overweight. Um, he believed that, you know, he was already eating a really healthy diet. It was sugar-free. It was gluten-free. It was a Mediterranean diet. That's what he had chosen for his brain health. And it did help him to some extent, but not enough. Um, so, uh, he wore a glucose monitor. And as you can see, the most important signs of poor carbohydrate metabolism are very unstable glucose levels and glucose levels that spike too high. So a healthy goal is to keep glucose under 140 milligrams per deciliter. Um, it's under the pink, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the yellow range or green range. Ideally, even under 125 is even better. But as you can see, he had a lot of variability in his glucose levels, and he had a spike to well over 140 after eating a snack. And that snack, I asked him what, what had he eaten. 
Uh, he had eaten um, a snack that was a, a small amount of plain unsweetened yogurt topped with whole grains and a single piece of salmon nigiri, you know, the little ri bite ri rice bump with a piece of raw fish on top and four mushrooms. That was enough to give him an unhealthy, a dangerous glucose spike. So it wasn't, it wasn't good enough for his personal metabolism. And then you can see in blue, that's what the glucose levels looked like on a ketogenic diet, meat, seafood, poultry, small amounts of non-starchy vegetables. Um, nothing at all for, for the brain to worry about. So uh, we do need glucose in the brain. Uh, we don't need much, but we do need some at all times. The brain cannot run on ketones alone. Um, so uh, a lot of people think of glucose as the best fuel for the brain, and they think of ketones as an emergency backup fuel. But really the truth is that the brain loves ketones. It's designed to burn um, on a mixture of glucose and ketones and to be able to go back and forth um, between uh, you know high, high ketone and lower ketone levels and higher glucose and lower glucose. It's, it's designed to be metabolically flexible. So, but it really does love to burn ketones. They burn more safely, they burn more cleanly, they burn more efficiently than glucose molecules do. And in fact, um, uh, the uh, most brain cells will choose to burn ketones over glucose if given a, cho a choice. But glucose has some advantages. You might think, why can't the brain run entirely on ketones? It can't because uh, first of all, glucose burns faster than ketones. And there are certain cells, certain rapid fire cells and certain construction pathways inside brain cells that require glucose. They cannot use ketones. So some part of the brain needs to have glucose at all times. Ketones can only satisfy about two thirds of the brain's total fuel demand. But it's been known now for a century that ketogenic diets have the power to stop epileptic seizures in their tracks. And if that isn't proof that ketogenic diets can stabilize brain chemistry, what would be? Um, it's just a really dramatic example of, of, of uh, stabilizing brain chemistry. So in addition to 100 years of clinical experience, there's, there are numerous animal studies, laboratory studies, and at least now over a dozen randomized controlled trials considered the, the, the highest level of scientific evidence more than 50% of patients with epilepsy experience a substantial reduction in seizure activities, the very good response rates. And there's emerging evidence for the use of ketogenic diets in other neurological conditions as well, as you can see on this slide. So the conditions in bold are the ones that have the strongest evidence base behind them, including randomized controlled trials. But the, this robust evidence uh, base in neurology is really good news for psychiatry because in my opinion anyway, the, the line between neurology and psychiatry is an imaginary line. Uh, the brain isn't divided into neurology cells and psychiatry cells, it's one organ. Uh, it requires the same nutritional care. It stands to reason that an intervention that helps with neurological conditions of many types could also help with psychiatric conditions of many types. And perhaps the best example of this is bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder and epilepsy share many underlying features uh, and we even prescribe many of the same medications to treat both conditions, seizure medications. Uh, and one of the many examples of the things that these two conditions have in common is that uh, in, both, in both bipolar disorder and epilepsy, sodium levels inside brain cells can be too high. And if sodium levels are too high, brain cells are too reactive. They're, they're likely to fire when they shouldn't. So both seizure medications and the ketogenic diet lower sodium levels inside cells and that calms the nerve cells and stabilizes their activity. So, and although the study of ketogenic diets specifically for the treatment of psychiatric disorders is in infancy, we're at a really exciting turning point because academic interest in this topic is suddenly exploding. You'll see uh, lots of hypothesis papers in the literature. Um, and now we have a growing number of case reports and small clinical trials to inspire us as well. Um, uh, case reports of several of bipolar disorder type two, uh, superior to mood stabilizers, uh, people with schizophrenia having significant reductions in psychotic symptoms, including two cases where the ketogenic diet was able to completely replace antipsychotic medications. Um, a case series of three patients with binge eating disorder and food addiction, complete remission even six months later, um, and with and significant weight loss as well from both binge eating and food addiction symptoms simply by lowering carbohydrate, 
uh, intake to 30 grams per day or less. Um, and we have some clinical studies of, uh, of several other conditions. So for example, several uh, studies already with autism, uh, two case reports, three small promising studies, uh, finding uh, improvements in behaviors, autism behaviors in children. In depression, we have a study by VertaHealth, uh, which is a diabetes, a virtual diabetes uh, treatment program, just published in 2022. People with mild depression uh, who with type 2 diabetes who were following the low-carb diet to treat their diabetes, it also helped with their depression symptoms. Um, now, these were only mildly clinically depressed patients. These were not severely clinically depressed patients, but this is the only study we have so far looking at major depression. A really interesting uh, pilot of randomized controlled trial, very small study, uh, showing that people who followed a ketogenic diet um, when they were admitted for treatment of alcohol withdrawal, they required 50% less uh, Cerex, less benzodiazepine to manage alcohol withdrawal symptoms than the patients who were following a standard uh, diet that was uh, uh, available in the hospital. And we have a, a handful of case reports and small clinical trials that show glimmers of hope in people with mild cognitive impairment and early Alzheimer's disease. Uh, by the way, you'll have you'll have access to all the, the, the you'll get a PDF of all these slides uh, if you want to look more closely at these studies. Um, and uh, you'll also be receiving a, a packet that includes uh, uh, links, live links to um, a lot of these studies. So you can read them for yourself if you're curious to learn more. I know I'm going through them fairly quickly. So, um, so we have these, these case reports and small clinical trials, uh, glimmers of hope. The results in Alzheimer's disease are modest. Um, they're just as good or better than existing medication treatments, but we all know that that's not saying much because Alzheimer's medications have really a pretty dismal track record of, of making any clinical difference on people with, with cognitive impairment. Uh, even the most rigorous uh, trial to date uh, was a randomized control trial in 2021. Uh, patients did score higher on quality of life measures, but they did not score higher on cognitive tests on a ketogenic diet. Um, and you know, Alzheimer's is a neurodegenerative disease. Uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, damage to the existing brain tissue has already occurred. Therefore, prevention is definitely the best strategy. But there are excellent examples of people with cognitive decline improving substantially with lifestyle interventions, um, including in my own practice. Um, and uh, if we have time, I may come back to, to Fran's story and play this for you. But just in the interest of time, I'm just going to tell you that um, uh, uh, if, you would, if you'd like to, it's just a two minute video and I can come back to it if you'd like to hear uh, her experience. I just wanna make sure though, with uh, in the interest of time uh, um, that we move through what, what's, what we've got left here. So um, in June of last year, I, I, I wrote and published a paper in collaboration with uh, Dr. Um, Eric Westman and Dr. Laura Saslow documenting the findings of uh, Dr. Albert Danan, a friend and colleague of mine, a psychiatrist practicing in Toulouse, France. He's been practicing there for more than 30 years, uh, inspired by a young family member of his who had, had he'd experienced remarkable improvement in autism and epilepsy symptoms within just a few weeks of starting a ketogenic diet. So Dr. Danan invited 31 of his most treatment resistant patients with major depression, bipolar disorder, type two, schizoaffective disorder, and many other coexisting conditions and metabolic um, illness to try a ketogenic diet in the hospital under his close supervision to see what would happen. He was curious to see if these people who hadn't responded uh, to all of, all of the other care he had provided for them for many years and sometimes in many over many decades, he'd known some of these patients for decades, and they weren't improving much. Many of them were on psychiatric disability and on multiple medications. So he invited them uh, to volunteer. And what he, what he noticed was that 28 out of 30, 31 of them were able to follow a ketogenic diet for at least two weeks, which is long enough to start to see improvements. And all 28 of those people who were able to stick with the diet improved to some extent, both uh, 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 medically and psychiatrically regardless of their diagnosis. And 43% of these highly treatment resistant patients 
43% uh, of them achieved clinical remission. Almost everyone lost weight, even though almost all of them were taking antipsychotic medications known to make weight loss extremely difficult. And 64% were discharged from the hospital on less psychiatric medication. And as you probably know, you do not see that. Uh, you do not see outcomes like this in conventional inpatient psychiatric care. And this study represents the largest number of adults with mental illness by far to have ever been treated with a ketogenic diet in a hospital setting. Now, it wasn't a randomized controlled trial, so we can't say for sure that the ketogenic diet was the reason why these people got so much better. But we believe it probably was because all of these patients had been hospitalized in the past under Dr. Danan's care in this very same hospital or in a similar sister facility in, in, the, in the county, often multiple times before with only minimal improvement. The only difference this time was the ketogenic diet. So, what we can say is that this version of a ketogenic diet was feasible to administer, it was medically and psychiatrically safe, and it was associated with substantial psychiatric and metabolic improvements, significant reductions in fasting blood sugar, significant reductions in hemoglobin A1C, blood pressure, liver function tests, and triglycerides. Seven out of 14 patients with high triglycerides saw their triglycerides drop by 100 milligrams per deciliter or more. So this is a really uh, very, very powerful intervention. We have more studies on the way uh, uh, in no small part, thanks to the Bazuki Foundation, which is a, a relatively new philanthropic organization, uh, which has been funding um, ketogenic metabolic therapy studies of, of mental illness, ketogenic diets for mental illness. Um, the the Bazuki uh, Fund was uh, founded by um, Jan Ellison Bazuki her, and her husband, um, whose son put his own bipolar disorder into full remission, lasting remission with a ketogenic diet. So inspired by that experience, they are um, they are now they're funding studies around the world um, and supporting the kinds of of work that I and other people interested in in doing this kind of work are, are doing. So they're a wonderful organization. Um, and so, you know, sometimes when people say, well, you know, do we have enough science to be practicing this way? And, you know, I, of course, you know, we do need more studies to convince skeptical clinicians and allow the ketogenic diet to enter mainstream psychiatric care. Some people really, you know, need to see those large randomized controlled trials before they feel comfortable using these interventions. But I, I don't believe we need uh, uh, more studies in order to offer these patients, the, uh, offer these uh, interventions to patients who are suffering right now, who can't afford to wait for large, rigorous, randomized control trials of their particular diagnosis to be conducted. Uh, we don't have enough clinical research yet to tell any given patient whether the ketogenic diet is likely to help them with their particular issue. So I tell people, you know, we don't know what's possible for you unless we try. I mean, we know this is safe um, if, if we know what to watch out for, and we'll go through that. But, but ketogenic diets make sense to consider for most psychiatric diagnoses because ketosis improves overall brain health. It improves the ability of the brain to access energy. And without enough energy, the brain cannot function properly. So my view is that the science is already here. It's just that the clinical trials need to catch up. Um, and one of the resources I've shared with you is an open letter to, to, to colleagues summarizing the scientific and clinical rationale for the use of ketogenic diets and psychiatric disorders, and it includes a list of scientific references. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it, it is something that does require some specialized knowledge and skill to implement safely in clinical practice. It's a really powerful metabolic intervention, and that's a a double-edged sword. Uh, it's more powerful than any, any other dietary intervention. And you want, that's what you want. You don't just want to be nibbling around the edges with people's diets by improving this, that, or the other thing. You really want to fundamentally improve the, the nutritional and metabolic quality of the diet to see the results you're looking for. Um, but it has profound effects <clears throat> on, <clears throat> on brain and body chemistry within only a few days. <clears throat> These are really healthy changes. You can see blood sugar come down very quickly. You can see blood pressure come down very quickly. These are all good and healthy changes, but you have to manage that transition period uh, carefully, especially if they're taking certain medications or have certain pre-existing health conditions. Um, uh, so in some cases, 
The psychiatric condition can temporarily worsen before it improves. So that managing all of that in the beginning does require some special knowledge and skill. So there's there's in the training program that I that I run, uh, there's a whole hour on uh, medication management, and there's you know lots of lots of safety topics covered. But for the purpose of the presentation for today, just let me say this: ketogenic diets are safe for most adults, provided they are properly constructed of healthy, nutritious foods, and that the medications and medical conditions are carefully monitored, particularly during that early adaptation phase. There are some. Getting a child to adhere to that yes. Next to so I have a question. Okay, so um, there are some people who should not attempt a ketogenic diet. So we go over that in the course as well. Like for example, um, uh, people with anorexia should not be prescribed a ketogenic diet. Um, uh, pregnant women, nursing women, certain health conditions. There are some contraindications that uh, that are covered more in the training program, but I just want you to be aware of these because if you're feeling like you might have uh, some, some knowledge already in this field and, and you're you're wanting to use these in your practice, just be aware that there are some contraindications as well. But these diets are not for everybody. Um, so um, uh, yes, contraindicated in anorexia as we were talking about before. Um, so uh, the ketogenic diet is safe under uh, when, it's, when it's being properly monitored uh, and it's it being used in, under appropriate circumstances. Um, so ketosis is not a strange metabolic state, uh, kind of a last ditch, uh, a sort of a last resort for people with dire mental health conditions. Ketosis is a healthy and normal metabolic state. We are designed to go in and out of, in, in and out of ketosis uh, from the time uh, that we are in the womb. Uh, we are designed to go back and forth between um, a, a lower glucose, higher ketone state and, and vice versa. Every night when we're sleeping, we go into ketosis. Um, babies are in ketosis in the womb, even if the mother is not. Uh, we go into ketosis between meals when we're fasting, when we restrict calories, and if we eat a ketogenic diet, it's a very um, normal and healthy state to be in. So, from a scientific standpoint, um, it's it's um, this is this is for if you look at the foods that are on this this slide. Um, this is what a typical ketogenic diet uh, food list might look like. It certainly doesn't look dangerous uh, to most people. So from a clinical standpoint, um, uh, from a from a um, uh, sorry, from a scientific standpoint, ketosis addresses many of the root causes of psychiatric conditions. So it reduces inflammation and oxidative stress, promotes healing, helps stabilize neurotransmitter and hormonal systems, and provides a clean, safe source of fuel that burns beautifully even in the insulin resistant brain, which again, most of us are now unfortunately in this. Uh, uh, in this uh, situation. And from a clinical standpoint, um, it represents a promising option for the growing numbers of people who don't want medication, don't respond to medication, don't tolerate medication. And, you know, having practiced psychiatry for 20 years, it's a, a real joy to have something else to offer all of those people. And then, you know, in addition to, um, in addition to targeting many, uh, many of the root causes of mental health conditions with, with one tool, um, the, the other thing that's really nice about it is that instead of side effects, I mean, I spent the first 10 years of my psychiatric career, 50% of each appointment talking about medications and side effects and managing those side effects and getting blood tests to make sure that the med medications weren't causing problems. Um, sometimes even prescribing other medications to counteract the side effects of medications. What's really nice about the ketogenic diet is what you mostly see especially once you get past the keto adaptation phase is side benefits, just benefits for overall, not just brain health, but physical health, metabolic health as well. And I wanted to um, just share uh, to wrap up before we chat some, um, this is uh, Carl graciously allowed me to share his story. 65 year old salesman, avid cycler, bikes about a hundred miles or more a week, very physically fit. So he's had a lifelong depression, anxiety, ADHD. He'd eaten a standard American diet his entire life. Um, and years ago, he went to a specialty psychiatric clinic uh, in California, had brain images, lots of specialized testing. He walked out of the clinic 
thousands of dollars later with three diagnoses and three prescriptions. Um, he started the, the medications. They triggered the first manic episode of his life, nearly destroyed his marriage and his career, made him understandably afraid to take medications ever again. So he, he came off those medications and decided, I'm going to manage my mood disorder with rigorous exercise. He just didn't know what else to do, but he certainly didn't want to go back on medication. So for years, the exercise worked fairly well for him. It kind of kept the mood disorder at bay. It was never completely gone. But as he got older, the symptoms started to creep back in. And then one, uh, something stressful happened at work and it triggered a three month episode of restlessness and insomnia. When he first consulted with me, he was walking, um, uh, he was biking during the day you know, after work and he was biking on weekends, but at night he'd get this restlessness and it wasn't safe to bike. So he could walking and he was walking between eight and 25 miles at night to try to get rid of this energy. He was exhausted. He, he said, I don't have time. I don't have time to manage this with exercise anymore. So um, when I first saw him, um, he scored a 15 out of 27 on the, on the PHQ-9 depression questionnaire. And his anxiety score is very high on the JD7, 17 out of 21. He, he wanted, there were many different options we had available to him, uh, ways he could change his diet. He wanted to start with a, what's called a carnivore diet, which plant-free diet. It's automatically kind of a mildly ketogenic diet. Um, he'd read about it online from, from other people as well as myself and wanted to, he wanted the fastest relief possible. And he was hoping that that would do that for him. So, um, so he ate nothing but a fatty meat every day without counting carbs or anything. He, he just measured his urine ketones every day. They were, he was in mild ketosis. And at six weeks, his scores on both of these uh, tests were zero. And again, you don't see that in conventional psychiatry. You don't see um, a complete resolution of, of symptoms like this. And um, so uh, in, in this case has been an ongoing case. I can answer more questions about it. He's since expanded his diet considerably and has remained well. And this is one of the, sometimes you can use a ketogenic or elimination or carnivore diet to, you can use these different types of diets as a temporary reset. And then you can try expanding from there to find out how much carbohydrate can this person tolerate? Um, uh, so there are lots of creative, you can, you can be really creative in your practices with these approaches, but I just wanted to share his quote after six weeks, just another awesome week, six weeks without any symptoms of anxiety, agitation, or depression. Overall, I'm consistently feeling better than I have for my entire life. And, and this is, this is the joy of practicing this way is that sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes you hear phrases like this, like I've never felt this well before. Um, so um, if you're interested in learning more about ketogenic diets, the training program uh, is, is available or the next one start. We're going to start in April. I'm starting to schedule them this week. If you're, if you'd like to join us, um, be running two or three groups in April uh, already and can add more. Um, and, or if you want to refer somebody who already knows how to use ketogenic diets, or if you want to collaborate with other people who are using ketogenic diets in their practice, this is a new directory um, that we just that we just started, uh, completely free to use and completely free to post. If you already use these diets in your clinical work, um, you can you can post your your listing here on the directory. Uh, this is for clinicians of all backgrounds, uh, not just prescribers, but also coaches and nurse practitioners and um, social workers, psychologists, um, anybody who uses these diets in their clinical work uh, for mental health in particular. So. Um, spread the word about the directory. It's still new. We've got about a uh, hundred listings over a hundred now from 19 countries. We, we really want to grow this and, and uh, see hundreds and hundreds of people because um, patients are looking for these interventions. There's a high demand and low. Uh, there's, there's very, very few people who know how to use these uh, diets in their practice. So um, we really want to put these tools in the hands of as many clinicians as possible and increase access for patients who are looking for these types of services. So thank you for listening. I, I hope you found it worth your time and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, at all. Um, uh, I'll, stop sharing, I'll stop sharing my slides now so we can see everybody's black box. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Georgia. There are some questions that have come in the chat. Great. 
Let's see, I'll start with the first one. I would like to know if the insulin resistance in the brain is an insulin signaling, pro signaling problem. What factors interfere with the signaling pathway? Oh boy, this is the question that will get you the Nobel Prize if you can answer it. So there are many, there are many different, uh, there, there are problems at, at, different, at, at different levels. So one, at one level, you have the uh, resistance at the receptor level. So the insulin receptors can become damaged or downregulated, so they can recoil and they, they may not surface. Uh, there may not be as many of them that surface. And that's a natural process of the cells protecting themselves from overstimulation by insulin. So there's a natural insulin resistance that happens just to protect the cell from being overstimulated by insulin because on a normal healthy diet, the way we evolved to eat, we, we wouldn't have been in glucose processing mode 24 seven, constantly taking in uh, all these glucose molecules and trying to deal with them. And it's a stress on the cell. It causes a lot of inflammation and oxidative stress. So the cell protects itself by pushing back a little and saying, I'm not gonna put as many insulin receptors on my surface because I just can't, uh, I need, you know, I need to pace myself. So there's that natural physiological resistance, um, but then there can also be over time, and, and people are still trying to sort this out, there can be damage to the actual signaling pathway. So there can be, it's a very uh, complex signaling process. Whoever asked this question probably already knows a lot about this, but it's a multi-step uh, uh, pathway that involves many different enzymes and different molecules um, that can become, uh, and, and those, those processes can become damaged over time uh, due to due to inflammation and oxidative stress, so there's some damage as well as some um, some natural recoiling that is protective. If that makes sense, is that was that the answer? Is it, was that close enough to what you were hoping to hear, Lori? If that answers your question, uh, let us know. Just you can just say so. <laughs> yes, it did answer my question. Thank you so much. And your lecture was very interesting. And I am a nutritionist. I'm not a psychiatrist. So I've been working a lot on insulin resistance. And I find this uh, topic in the brain is just fascinating. I'm so glad. And you know, for, for any of you who are nutritionists or, or dietitians who, are, who might be listening, there's a fantastic training specifically for nutrition professionals um, that is given by um, by Beth Zupek uh, uh, Kania and Denise Potter. They're registered dietitians with years and years of experience with ketogenic diets um, in children and adults. It's a fantastic online training. Highly, highly recommend uh, if you're a nutrition professional. Thank you. Sure. Kathy, I can take this next one. Um, okay. Jeremiah is... Um, uh, agreeing that uh, he commonly sees patients report improved mood, better mental clarity, focus in uh, with low carb keto program diets in a weight management department. And really there's nothing more re rewarding. Um, he says that we often are discontinuing antidepressants, antipsychotics, uh, which also help with weight loss and metabolic health. And then he goes on to ask, he's curious, I think this is your question, Jeremiah. He's curious um, when testing for fasting insulin, what thresholds you're using and if you're using the craft study. In addition, he says he's wondering if we'll see metabolic psychology, psychiatry fellowships. Love that oh. question. Yeah, so first of all, hi, Jeremiah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so great, great to meet you. Uh, and uh, so let's see. So I forgot to mention that one of the resources I'm sharing with all of you is the uh, list of insulin resistance tests. And that's really important. I should have said that and I, I forgot. Um, so that includes the craft assay, includes um, all the target ranges for fasting insulin, for triglyceride HDL ratio, waist to height, all, all the different, there are lots of different ways of, uh, as, as I'm sure you know, Jeremiah, lots of different ways to test for insulin resistance, including the craft insulin assay, which is the most complicated way to do it, but also the most, the most, um, what's the word? Um, accurate. <laughs> so, so uh, I don't use the craft insulin assay in, in my practice. I haven't found it necessary. And it's, it's you know, it's complicated, it involves lots of blood draws and people going to the lab and all of that. Um, I, I mean, I use much simpler measures, a fasting insulin, a triglyceride to HDL ratio, waist to height uh, ratio, things like that. Um, I, I also check fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C, although I don't care if they're normal because they can stay normal, you know, for many, many years, uh, even if somebody has severe insulin resistance. 
So, um, so the, the fasting insulin cutoff, I mean, I really like to see fasting insulin in the single digits, um, below 10, definitely. And even, I mean, ideally, uh, below five. So five or below is wonderful. Um, below 10 is good. Uh, five or below is great. That's how I think about it anyway. Um, and I'd be curious to know what you use. And then, uh, in terms of fellowships, it's great you asked that because I just came back yesterday from a metabolic psychiatry meeting in Miami hosted by the Bazuki Foundation. Um, and this meeting was, uh, the, the purpose of this meeting was to um, gather uh, information uh, to, to have people talk about the next clinical trials, what, you know, kind of designing those clinical trials and what needs to happen. And one of the clinicians there is Dr. Shabani Sethi, who is a metabolic psychiatrist at Stanford. And she, um, she actually coined the term metabolic psychiatry, and she um, is the director of the first metabolic psychiatry clinic, which is at Stanford. And she just uh, 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 broached the topic with her department director to, to launch a metabolic psychiatry fellowship at Stanford. She just brought it up apparently with him last week or the week before. So they haven't talked about you know what might be possible there, but that's her goal is to start a fellowship there. And um, if that happened, that would be the first one. Uh, so, so, and, and we need, we need lots of them. I think one is not enough. <laughs> Go ahead, Kathy. Okay, the next question from Stephanie. Um, interested in hearing more about your experience with patients, adherence to this diet over time. <laughs> Okay, that's the million dollar question. It is really hard. Um, I mean, it's, it's simple, like the concept is simple, but adherence is a bear because the food environment that we live in is, uh, is, is really, really challenging. I mean, just temptations to eat carbs are everywhere. These are addictive, they're convenient, they're delicious, and we're, we're conditioned to eat them from a very young age. It's really, really tough. And so adherence is, 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 I mean, I think one of the things that really helps with adherence is group support, education. Um, uh, and the other thing that really helps is the internal motivation that comes from having experienced the benefits. So if you can get somebody through the adaptation phase, which is the hardest part, to the other side where they actually start to experience, usually by, well, in some people it's within three days, and other people it might take two or three weeks. And on the outside, it's usually no more than six weeks. You will, people will feel a significant difference uh, in their brain and their bodies. And that is a really motivating experience. <laughs> they, even if they fall off the diet, which most of them will, they'll want to get back on and they'll get better and better and better at staying on it for longer and longer and longer. And it's not about being perfect about it all the time. It's about getting better at it over time. And uh, this is one of the goals of the training program is to help clinicians figure out, okay, how are we going to what are you going to do if the patient goes off the diet and they, you know, they, they get depressed again, or they, you know, their psychosis returns, you know, how do you manage all of those scenarios? But yes, a low carb diet and a ketogenic diet, they are challenging. But the, and the other thing I would say about this is um, most people who try a truly ketogenic diet where they're actually in ketosis, find it easier to stay on that diet than on any other diet they've ever tried because it manages appetite and cravings so much better than other diets do. Still not easy, but easier, easier, I would argue, than trying to stay on a low calorie diet or um, a low fat diet or any other type of diet. George, if I could just add, I'm glad you emphasized those last two things. Cravings fading for processed foods, sugars, improved satiety, transformative, uh, particularly when paired with having one supportive partner in the house. Yes. As well as, you know, as you've already alluded to, it's a whole other talk, but having those behavioral and emotional eating tools to just try to rewire the processes that come with trauma and coping with food as a hardwired, you know, process that as adults, we can learn other tools to manage our stressors. And by doing so, we can improve insulin resistance and mental health. So just wanted to add that. I think that's a fantastic addition. Tra trauma and attachment to food are huge. Uh, in, in our population and addressing those compassionately without judgment and helping people uh, learn new tools to, to cope with those types of things. It's, 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 it can be a long process, uh, kind of, it's going to require, I, I tell people in the training program, 
you're going to, you're going to require, you're going to use every tool and skill and piece of education you have <laughs> in this work. You have to bring your whole self into it and everything, you know, because it's not just like writing a prescription. It's, it's, it's a, it's a whole intervention, a whole person intervention. I, I think you said that really well. Dr. Eisenschenk, you are mentioning also here the uh, Dr. Eric Westman from Duke University food list. Is that something that you're using, Dr. Eid? Yes, I, and something else I, I, I'm glad to be able to mention. So that, that study that I was telling you about, the, the French study um, that we published in the summer, that's an open access paper. So if you go to that paper, and it's in your materials that I've shared with you, if you go to that paper and you click on the supplemental materials, it's all free, the, the, it's open, open access. On the supplemental materials, it lists the actual diet and the food list that, that Dr. Danan used with his patients. It's extremely simple, whole foods diet. It's modified from Dr. Eric Westman's plan. Um, it's basically Eric Westman's plan with a French twist <laughs> and, uh, and it limit, and it also puts a little bit of a cap on protein, which, which uh, Dr. Westman doesn't always do. So, but it's a really simple, easy diet. And when you look at it, you may think, well, that's the diet that got 43% of people into remission. That's, that's, there's nothing special about this. It, it's really kind of remarkable. Uh, and so some of my patients print that out from the paper. They go to the supplement and they click on the something and they print and they put it on their refrigerator. They this is my food list. This is my safe food list. We have uh, room for just one more question here, uh, Dr. Eden. That is um, from Lisa. In addition to your work with patients on nutrition, what are your thoughts and experience with assessing like in lab work for food sensitivities, genomics, and, and likewise. Yeah, so I do have an interest in food sensitivities, having had so many of them myself. There are no reliable laboratory tests for food sensitivities. Even in 2023, still no, no reliable tests. Despite what so many um, food testing companies which have you believe, they're not reliable. So the, still in this, this day and age, the only way to know if you have a food sensitivity is to, is to take it out and put it back in. And as, as frustrating as that is, that's still the only way to do it because they're not, they're not true food allergies. There are no good markers. There are no good blood markers for food sensitivities. So um, yeah, I guess it's kind of a disappointing answer. But... <laughs> Thank you. Sure. A disappointing answer, perhaps in the midst of such great information, um, Georgia, we are absolutely grateful to you today for providing this information and um, look forward to hearing more. We, we certainly, of course, look forward to your book. And uh, this is fascinating. Um, I, I think I'd like to uh, have the opportunity to send just a few more questions at some point, if that's at all possible. I was just gonna offer that whatever yeah. questions I haven't had a chance to answer, because I think, look, I, I, I don't know if I went a little bit over time, but please send me the questions. I definitely will answer them. So okay. send them along. Yes, please. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And uh, you all, everybody, take good care. Thanks, everybody. Thank so much. Thanks, uh, Thanks, Georgia. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming, everybody.